Consolidation subsequent to acquisition date. Topic two, consolidated income and retained earnings statements. That is, consolidated statements. First, we'll take a look at consolidated net income. So similar to preparing the balance sheet, the goal is to combine the revenues and expenses of the two companies. That is, the goal is to represent the economic reality of the parent and what they control. In order to do this, income from the parent's investment in the sub is removed. Net income is divided between the amounts attributable to the parent and the NCI, that not your company, at the bottom of the income statement. So essentially, we smush the two financial statements together of the parent and the sub. We remove any dividends that the sub declared and the parents received. And we also, at the bottom, um, oh, we also, there, there's some more fun in there, but we, uh, <laughs> we reflect um, the economic reality of the combined financial statements. And then at the bottom, we separate the amounts if the parent doesn't own 100% of the sub between the amount that the parent owns and then the not your company, the NCI portion at the bottom. Let us revisit our friend, the fair value differentials or FVDs. Those are the things that in a prior video, in a prior lesson, those are the things that went between your acquisition differential and goodwill when you were uh, recording this at acquisition. Okay, so they're back. And these are what are gonna create the bulk of the work for the next few chapters. <laughs> You're welcome. So really, what do they represent big picture wise? The difference between the subs book value, BV, and fair value, FV, at acquisition. And then the passage of time. Huh? Well, essentially, per the accounting standards, what we need to do is have a mix of reporting of the sub at fair value at acquisition, and then reflect the economic reality of the passage of time subsequent to that acquisition without any more consideration to the sub's actual fair value of their assets and liabilities. Well, other than under very limited circumstances, such as impairment, or matters outside of the scope of this course, such as the subs who maybe use revaluation method to record their assets. Okay, so let's go into this. What? FVDs, fair value differentials, adjust the carrying value of assets or liabilities, aka pesky negative assets, on the consolidated financial statements. They must be removed over time in line with the way the asset was used or sold. For PP&E, the differential, the fair value differential, is amortized over the course of its useful life, like depreciation. For land, the differential is removed when the land is sold. For inventory, it's generally in the year subsequent of acquisition, as inventory should be sold FIFO and within one year, unless otherwise stated. Debt, it's recorded as the principal is repaid. Why? Well, because the underlying asset or liability that you know, triggered the fair value differential to begin with is being used, quote unquote, used up. Therefore, the fair value differential tied to that underlying asset or liability needs to reflect the economic reality of that asset or liability being used or consumed. We will see many, many uh, examples of this in the coming uh, videos, chapters, tutorials, but please just understand this is the underlying why. We have to set it up for what it was at acquisition and then what's happened up to the beginning of the year and then what's happened subsequent to the beginning of the year. Let's dig in a little bit more to that. So let me ask you this. If you bought a share today for yourself, your own personal self, you bought a share today, your first share of this company ever, would you be entitled to receive a dividend declared before you owned it? Say last month last year, 10 years ago, before you were born. Heck no. So why should a company, a parent company acquiring a sub be any different? The answer, they're not. At acquisition, consolidated retained earnings 
are the retained earnings of the parent only. This is because at acquisition, the parent isn't entitled to any of the profits from the subsidiary before they got control over them, before you bought the share. After acquisition, consolidated retained earnings includes the parent's share of the subsidiary's operations, which means they now get to include the income of the sub on their financial statements, keeping in mind that if the parent didn't acquire 100% of the sub, they must provide a section on the income statement for not your company's share of profits or loss after the consolidated net income. From there, the cumulative nature of the NCI's share of the subsidiary's operations subsequent to acquisition is captured in the NCI equity account. So NCI income rolls over to NCI equity and um, regular parent income rolls into the consolidated uh, equity accounts for the parents. All right, this one is a bit of a stretch and you haven't explicitly learned this yet, but I want you to take a stab at it from an educated guest perspective. So what do you think? Which of the following would not be removed during the consolidation process? Would it be A, profit from the sale of inventory from a parent to a sub? B, dividends paid by the parent? C, gain from the sale of land from subsidiary to the parent? Or D, dividends paid by the subsidiary to the parent? The answer is B. Which of the following would not be removed from the consolidation process? We would not remove the dividends paid by the parents. That is because the dividends paid by the parents are going out. They're going out to a third party. Whereas all the other items in here are items that are happening between the parent and the sub. Let me discuss. Um, oh, otherwise known as intercompany transactions. And all intercompany transactions must be removed from the consolidated financial statements. Okay, so we need to remove all the stuff that happens between the two entities, and we can recognize the things that occur um, outside of the two entities, such as dividends being paid by the parent. So we're going to dive into this, don't worry, in more depth. But A, profit from the sale of inventory from parent to the sub, that would be reflected on the sub's entity financial statements and the prices paid on the sub's, pardon me, on the parent's um, balance sheet in the form of inventory. So we need to remove this during the consolidation process. Okay? Um, C, otherwise we'd be double counting it. C, the gain on sale of the land from sub to parent, same thing. The sub has a profit, the parent has a pricier land on their books than what the sub had needs to be eliminated. We cannot, when we have control over another uh, company, we can't just put transactions between the two, um, double count them, and then you know make it look like we're better or worse off. That's not the economic reality. Because when I control something, it's like I'm shifting something from my left hand to the right hand. I didn't really do anything. I just shifted it. Same thing. Dividends paid by the subsidiary to the parent. Remember, the parent owns the sub, uh, and either owns 100% of it or most of it. So if the dividends are paid by the sub, um, those are paid <laughs> and the parent would receive them because they own them. So essentially, if the parent controls the sub, the parent makes the sub declare dividends to receive it. We need to remove those during the consolidation process because we need to reflect the economic reality that nothing free can happen here. We just went from the left hand to the right hand. Okay. Listen, learning is repeated exposure to same or similar topics. You were doing awesome. Uh, friction, any friction felt, that is learning. And that is amazing. And that is what helps prime your brain uh, for, uh, for subsequent goodness. And it helps you, you know, really work smarter, not harder. So if this is frustrating, uh, I both agree. And I say good because it means that it is, it is being absorbed. Alrighty, I'll see you in the next video.